Welcome everybody to the Storytime channel, my name is Steven and today we have some pro revenge stories. Our first story of the day is by Story Skeller, park in a private space and block an entrance, pay the fines and the damages. This incident happened in the summer of 2018. I took a small part, but the real star was my landlord. A small background, it's common in my country to have apartment buildings next to houses, yard and all. I live in one such building, it has 10 apartments two on each of the first four floors, one on the ground floor and one on the top floor. The top floor is used by the landlord when he and his family come for vacations. He lives abroad. The rest are rentals. We also have a small backyard with a side entrance, important for later. Next to the building is an empty lot, also belonging to the landlord. We use it as a private parking space, with signs visibly saying it's private. It takes 10 cars, one per apartment, and has the side entrance. Also, I was the longest tenant, so I was the superintendent. My job was to be the liaison between the tenants and the landlord and communicate any problems and concerns to him. The problem started when the house across the street from us was sold. A lovely old lady used to live there, but when she passed away, the house fell in disarray, especially the large yard. The new owners were Ken and Karen. Fake names, but lived up to the meme. They immediately began major renovations, which was acceptable. They also started to park their cars in our two empty spots, one for the landlord and one for the lady in the ground floor that didn't own a car. At first, we would tell them they were reserved spots and they would move their cars. But when they noticed the spots remained empty, they parked there permanently. I had notified the landlord and he told me to take pictures, log every incident and always notify the police. We started doing that every day. Ken is a hotshot local businessman and every time we called the cops, he would cause a scene about us being jerks. He always got a fine, but he very blatantly proclaimed he will not pay. The worst part came about a month before the landlord's annual visit. They stopped using one of their cars and left it permanently in front of the side entrance, blocking it. That was a huge issue. You see, the lady living in the ground floor is a renal dialysis patient and three times a week goes for a session in the local hospital. The ambulance brings her back and usually parks next to the side entrance because she is exhausted after a session. With Karen's car parked there, that wasn't doable anymore. They don't move it even when the police is called. I notify the landlord and try to hold our own hothead from doing anything foolish. The calmer thing he proposed was slashing their tires. Finally, our landlord arrives. I hand him the photos and the logs and he calls Ken over. Tony, the landlord, calmly explains that they are not allowed to park in our space and to move the cars. Ken's response was, who the heck do you think you are? I can park anywhere I want. Now, Ken thinks of himself as a big fish in our small town, but Tony is a big fish in a major foreign city, and he is very creative when somebody pisses him off. He tells us to leave the spot next to the side entrance open for the weekend, and he will take care of things. We do that, and Ken parks his car next to his wife's. Sunday evening, a tow truck arrives and unloads an old Citroen DS, also known as The Frog, blocking both of their cars. Monday morning, I wake by the buzzer and when I go downstairs, Ken and Karen are there. They are both livid. They can't move either car. Tony joins me, all smiles. Ken sees him and blows a casket. He starts shouting and cursing. Tony, still smiling, replies, I don't see a problem. My car is legally parked. What are you going to do about it? Ken angrily gets into his car and reverses on the DS, crushing them both. Tony's smile becomes one of a shark. He immediately called the police. He pressed charges against Ken. The aftermath? Tony had legally bought the DS from his cousin that owns a car repair and restoration shop. The car was a restoration project and was insured. The court found Ken liable for the damage done. They also found out he was true to his word and hadn't paid any of the tickets. The fines for the tickets alone were almost 2,000 euros. He also leased both his cars and they dropped him as a client immediately for purposely causing an accident and damaging the leased car. They are sued for damages. Ken got another car, but learned his lesson and hasn't parked in our spots ever since. Well, you would think the tickets alone would eventually catch up to Ken, but 
I guess you can't combat idiocy. If somebody kept parking in your spot, would you go ahead and try blocking them in just to see how it turns out? Let me know in the comments down below. Our next story is by Decaplinger. So my work isn't good enough, eh? During the last year of my career as a cop, I spent the majority of it on light duty due to medical issues that hit me out of nowhere. I knew the sheriff was gunning for me anyway, so I decided to have some fun. See, I was the chief of the court division of the sheriff's office. Also, I was assigned as our member investigator to our regional internet crimes task force. As part of my work for the department, I volunteered to be the webmaster for their site. I put a lot of work into it, but I finally had it working. Then they wanted me to add a new set of features to it that would allow deputies to log in and post events occurring during their shift, so that supervisors had an up-to-date record of all that was going on. There was a similar system in a neighboring county they wanted it modeled after. There were some slight issues though. The code base for the other county site was written in C Sharp and operated on a Windows based server, while ours was a Linux server. Take a guess at who qualified as an expert in the courts regarding computer forensics of Linux based file systems and operations. Why, yours truly, of course. The sheriff of the other county was willing to provide me with the complete code base their designers had used. He knew we couldn't use it right off, so he had no problems with it. Now, for what they wanted, I could have done nothing but coding from dawn to dusk for three months solid, but I did it in three weeks, and not only had it matched what the other systems could do, I also built in a feature where a deputy could alert people on other shifts of events that happened so they could be in the know as well as a fully compliant email interface with MS Exchange allowing staff to send emails back and forth without having to leave the system. A great deal of the work I put into coding that site, I did from home, off the clock. I told them I could get it done in less than three months, and I wasn't going to disappoint them. The day came. Ta-da! Oh wait, they didn't really think I could do it. They were hoping for me to fail to give them a reason to fire me. The next day, my lieutenant comes up to my workstation and told me to come with me. I had gotten so tired of him trying to find a way to get me fired, I actually said, what did I do wrong this time? He responded with, you'll see. When we got to the door to enter the non-public area of the SO, we soon passed his office and instead went straight to the sheriff's office. He asked me for the web hosting details, I was hosting it for free on my server, as well as the ownership of the domain names. Obviously, even though I had control of both, both were property of the SO. My sheriff, who only a couple of months earlier was praising my name because I developed a site using the colors and fonts chosen for the designs on the patrol cars, said, We're going to switch to a different webmaster. We want someone more professional. Obviously, I could not see my face, but the way I felt, I think my head did a complete 360 like in The Exorcist. I was so offended by his statement, I kind of went into a trance. I had owned and operated a web hosting and design company for at least 8-10 to 10 years before I took over the department's site. I WAS a professional website developer. No one could have built them the custom site they requested as quickly as I did. I worked at least 40 hours at home off the clock on the project and was highly praised by the sheriff for the work. Yet only a few weeks later he wanted someone more professional? He wasn't fooling me. Fine. Cue my pro revenge. Not long before I was asked to build the new features for the website, one of my staff came to me, eyes down, to confess something he had done. He wasn't tech savvy, but one day he did a search and found a domain name was available for purchase. It just so happened to be the domain name the sheriff had used for his first campaign less than four years earlier. Apparently, no one thought to check to see the status of the domain as the new election approached. Once he told me, I promised him I'd take care of it, so I got access to the registrant account to change the name servers to an anonymous host. I learned from my computer crimes contacts the sheriff was trying to use federal officers to try to trace me to find out who was doing what with his domain. Well, good luck with that. I was proxied from heck and back, using seven hops through three providers and on the Tor network. Every time I logged into the website I was building, there was no way to trace who was doing it. The sheriff knew my coworker had purchased the domain, but that was the limit of his involvement. 
So it's important to note, the sheriff had to resign in disgrace and accepted a plea deal to plead guilty to a couple of federal felonies. Who blew the first whistle of issues going on in the department? We did. Even better, without realizing it, for most of his second campaign, all of his signs still had the original website listed. The website listed all the factual things the sheriff or his minions were doing that were unlawful, immoral, or unethical. I only listed the stuff I could independently verify through two other sources. My staff and I were the first people to contact the state and the FBI regarding illegal activities being perpetrated in the SO. The command staff resigned and ran like roaches once the news came out the sheriff had been charged. I guess he should have hired someone more professional to handle his PR. In the end, he still won the second election, but wasn't able to carry out his full term due to the crisis he was facing from his own past. Here I am, a retired law enforcement officer, still developing modern websites as a professional website designer. He could have gotten away with it all if he hadn't decided to try and screw me over with the whole internal web system. Speaking of that system, even though they pleaded with me to make it for them, it was never implemented. For the record, I often check to see if the website had been changed. Even years after I retired, my website was still up in its entirety without a single modification. This meant it still showed my name and photo on it for details on the court division. I've had people tell me being assigned to the courts does not amount to much. Obviously, they never walked a mile in my shoes. Sadly, I feel like name recognition is really mostly what matters when running in these kind of smaller elections. To be honest, I don't know if I've ever seen an election sign up on the side of the road or whatnot with a website and actually considered going to the website. Whenever I've voted, I do research on the candidates before I'm about to vote, not necessarily when I see a street sign, which is probably what contributed to them still winning in the end. And our final story of the day is by Gadget Owns Me. X yelled, had a temper tantrum about child support at his job, and blamed me in court for it. The next time I had to go to his work, he regretted it. My friend said to post this here. My ex is an abusive pile of crap and we had a kid together. I left him while I was pregnant, but I would take the baby to see him on his lunch hour occasionally. He paid $29 US a month in child support for a very long time. I got it reviewed when he got that job, and it went to $89 US a month. When he found out how much it went up, he threw a screaming temper tantrum in his work and chased me out of the building with our 9 month old. We had family court a few days later, and he blamed me for everything. He even got his friend to lie and say he was there and I started it. The judge thankfully didn't believe him, but I was told to continue these terrible visits at his work. Now for the revenge. It was a furniture rental store, and he would constantly badmouth customers in very detailed ways. The next, and last time I took our baby there, I sat down with a small notepad and wrote down the names he and the other person said, how many mouths they said they were behind, and how much they said owed, and every name he and his buddies called every single person. There were quite a few racial slurs said that day. When time was up, he had to leave and I told his boss. The boss didn't do a darn thing. I knew three people he was badmouthing, and I knew how to get in touch with five or so others. I worked my way through that list telling people exactly how their personal financial info was being released and the names they were called. He and his buddy lost their jobs the next day, and the owner filed a restraining order against them. I didn't feel bad at all. OP went on to clarify that this happened almost 20 years ago and the child is safe and an adult now, and that for some reason this was just the arrangement the mediator had arranged for them, so OP had to go and would just kind of sit there and study for school. Just imagine being so bold to be that comfortable calling people disgusting things in front of people that you're not even on great terms with. They were really gambling just being able to blatantly say those things with another person sitting there listening into them, and I'm glad that OP did the right thing and spoke up about this, because nobody deserves to be called stuff behind their backs like that, especially not involving their financial info getting out there. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today, so if you have a favorite story of the day, let me know which story and why in the comments down below. 
But besides that, if you enjoyed the video, please consider giving it a like, and if you haven't, subscribe and turn notifications on so you'll never miss an upcoming video. No matter what you do, whether it's just viewing the video, liking, subscribing, turning notifications on, I appreciate the heck out of it. Every little thing that you do helps the channel grow that much more and I can't thank you enough for it. So until next time, I hope you all have a wonderful day and I'll be right here next time on the Storytime channel.